Welcome, everybody, on today's episode of 8020 Rockstars. We've got the one, the only, Jay Papazan. Welcome, Jay. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to get to chat with you again. We haven't caught up in a while. Yeah, it's been, uh, I think that was late last year, maybe, I think that we last spoke, the KW thing. Yeah, and I think I had you on our, um, We I, I interviewed you for our real estate investor series, How I Built It, and I think That's that right. happened since then. But yeah, it's been That's a while. Right. Yeah, so welcome. Um, so for those of you who don't know who Jay Popzon is, he's a best-selling author. Uh, he's got several books that I'm huge fans of. I'm in the real estate industry, as you know, the millionaire real estate agent, millionaire real estate investor, and my favorite one, which is worldwide renowned, The One Thing. So uh, I'm excited to talk about this book, uh, some real estate stuff, this book, and then things that are going on in your life today. So that's my, that's my goal for this conversation. Sounds great. So I wanted to talk, start talking a little bit about um, like KW, real estate industry, how the sales industry is changing. Cause I've, I've got like lots of questions and I'm curious to hear your insight. I know like you run Keller Inc and the, the education department, I believe and the publishing, right? That's right. So um, my first question would be, I've heard a lot about the MREA2 book coming out, the Millionaire, uh, sorry, Millionaire Real Estate Agent 2 book coming out. And I don't know how much you're allowed to say or not say, but is that, um, someone was just talking to me about it yesterday, is that there's a new version with like teams and, diff and, and, and different breakdowns of expenses. Is that something that's being worked the, on these days? We've, sh we've shared the new breakdowns on the budget and the okay. new org model with our MAPS partners and with Keller Williams University. So you can go and find those if you go into our KW Connect system. So we always, okay. we never hold that information back from our partners within the system. Awesome. And it's not, I mean, I'm sure it's out there just about anywhere. The biggest numbers that change are some of the percentages on the budget model. Okay. Because we have far more P&Ls than we originally had. Originally, yeah. you know, we, we talked to 27 of the top 50. Right. And a lot of them, it took multiple calls. We had to enlist Mo Anderson, our CEO at the time, to try to get someone, some of them just to get on the phone with us. Cause it was like yeah. Keller who, right. We weren't yeah. really on the map back in 2002. And today we have access to hundreds and hundreds of validated P and L's. We use a CPA and make sure that all of them are normed and as accurate as we can get and see bigger patterns and the businesses today. I mean, last year, the, the top team in our business, and I have to put team in sure. quotes, I mean, I think they uh, did well over 18 million in GCI. Um, I haven't looked it up, but the, it's, it's, it does them an injustice to refer to that business as a team, but yeah. it's a business within a business and it's massive. And so we have to constantly keep those things up to date because people are pushing the boundaries of what we could imagine. Yeah. And the other thing is that you probably know this, you just haven't seen the charts. Um, we've seen really big success with people uh, expanding. So we, we do have an expansion model and we also break up the org chart a little bit. Uh, a okay. lot of folks were hiring their way to the seventh level. Well, how do you know you're on the seventh level? Well, I have all of these people that I pay salary and commission to. And we kind of built it around uh, activities that you're focused on. So, you know, you don't get to jump to the fifth level until you're really not working with buyers anymore. You don't go to the sixth level until you're really not working with buyers or sellers anymore. And uh, we made it more about the, the unique aspect about real estate. And this is something that Gary taught me and it just still blows my mind. There's almost no other enterprise that day one, your job is all of the business, right? You have to do everything as a solo agent. Yeah. And as you shed those job descriptions and hire people to do them, your business will naturally grow. Like you can't just start in the kitchen of a restaurant or at the front desk of a hotel and day one be building the skills to run a hotel or a restaurant. You get yeah. to do that in real estate. So we just kind of created seven levels of shedding the biggest jobs mm. in biggest stages. And that kind of developed that. It's like the showing assistant. There's a few little steps in there that are different, but the biggest surprise is the fundamentals haven't changed, even though our industry and how people implement them has changed a lot. Hmm. So that brings up a lot of thoughts. And I, I yeah, I just, I just threw a bunch at you at once. So you know, if you need <laughs> to hit pause, we'll <laughs> I want to pick a couple things there. And I like, I never heard it mentioned that way, like defining the level that you're at, depending on which activities you're shedding. And I think that's a great way to, because we've had 
a little bit of challenges um, trying to figure, we're, my business partner and I, uh, we've been running kind of like separate set. We've been investing together for like three, four years, but kind of running separate sales businesses with a shared admin for, for that time period. Now we're finally about to like take the leap. We're in a, we're talking to our first agent and the first thing on our mind, and I'm sure looking at the, the P and L's and models will help, but we're, we're really trying to weigh like the, the, the team quote unquote model has changed a little bit. And so many people have different setups with either agents working with only buyers or sellers, or like you mentioned, the showing assistant, they'll have one lead buyer's agent and the more buyers you get, you just have more showing assistants. So we're having trouble figuring out, like, I don't know if you've seen any, I'm sure you've seen several different models that works, but is there anything in a, as a whole you've seen, like, what are the changes from maybe 10, 20 years ago that people are, how their the team structure is set up with the agents in particular? Like, are, are many people leaning towards the showing assistant model? That, that in particular is one of my biggest questions because we don't know whether we should have a buyer's agent and delegate the whole thing or keep a showing assistant and still do negotiations and all that. Well, one of the first things I would say is um, when we talk about shedding jobs, right? That's interesting language. There's a, the journey to going from being, you know, employed to self-employed to, you know, a business and an employer is the journey from going from I do it to we do it to they do it. Right. And it's not really business income until they do it, right? That time that you can kind of step out of the business and it just sends you checks. You'll probably right. still have a job, maybe chairman of the board, right? But you're out of the, the, the making of sales to make money. That is business income now versus sure. sales income, which can be job income. So I look up and there's a tension going on right now. And it's the people who've built their businesses, right? You can always jump. Like a model is just there to show you what we think is the, the best practices, Right, but right. that's general best practices, not best practices for you in particular, Rodney, or right. me in particular. So people make little tweaks. We just want you to know that you're making those tweaks based on your choices and your, you know exactly what you're giving up to make that change. So what's beautiful about the showing assistant is it, it, that you're shedding the job of showing homes, which is the most time consuming job you have in your, your sales world. And the people who master that then can choose from one or two showing agents, the person most likely to inherit and take the lead on your buyer business. And you think about the kind of leads you get for your business, right? You might get some high-end leads. You might get some investor leads. It's rare to find that person that's a perfect fit for all of them. Right. And right? that's the but challenge. It's a real challenge, right? You can get somebody who's young and they're, they'll really go after the leads. They've got amazing work ethic but maybe they don't connect as well with some people from your sphere that are more mature than they are, right? They haven't lived enough life. And then you, you have these challenges and just missing and matching. So it, it buys you time. It frees you up to do a lot more transactions with a minimum of like brain damage. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to <laughs> cherry pick. And what it offers you is a chance to have someone build their own business within yours. There are some people that are just meant to work with buyers. They love working with buyers. Right. I'm an introvert. I can't imagine it doing it for a week. Right? right. But there are some people, they love it. The constant, like there's a lot of joy in that journey, even though right now it's particularly challenging in general, there's a lot less rejection on the buyer side than on the seller side. And you're, you're giving people the keys to their home. There's a lot of happy moments and you get to do that for a lot of people. So eventually you'll raise one of your showing agents to buyer agents or just bring someone in. And they have the opportunity to build out their own buyer agent pool. And we've seen people like Jen Davis comes to mind, you know, multiple years in a row, she was doing over a hundred buyer units. Okay. Like that just, and she did it because she had showing assistants. All right. So you mean, yeah. And she's making massive income, right? She can have three or, you know, I've seen as many as three showing assistants. Theoretically, it could go bigger, but yeah. around two is a really sweet spot. If you have a really big business, a steady supply of leads, now you can have one showing assistant that really specializes in a part of town or in a class of, of, of buyer, and you can mix and match. Both of them can make a good wage. And you as the lead buyer agent or the mega agent, depending on how you've stacked it up, are making a lot of commission income, a lot more than you could do just by yourself. So yeah. that's a model. 
Now, the tension in the butt is, is, is not just between that and, and there's a lot of different ways to go, but when people start expanding, right? So they might've built the MREA model out with showing agents and buyer specialist and seller specialist, right? Those, that's the classic model. Mm -hmm. And it, it yields consistently the highest profit. Now, I start expanding into a new territory. I have leads that, you know, from Memphis to Nashville, Tennessee, or, you know, I'm, I'm in Baltimore, but the greater DC area, like whatever that is, you have leads that are naturally showing up enough to start a business there. Mm -hmm. So you drop an agent in there. Well, when you only have one agent there, you don't have you a specialist, right? You don't have the lead flow. And so people were looking up and they go, I have one compensation system in my hub where we have a mature business. And then I have another compensation system in my expansion or expansions where I have dual agents. And I believe, and this is again, like one of the things you could do as a business owner is I will make less money to have more leverage and less brain damage. If that was creating havoc in your bank account or your life, they just moved everybody to the, we're all generalists, no more specialists. And I can show you how you are leaving money on the table by doing that but it's a choice that you can make that simplifies everybody's on the same system. Right. And right. we know it, we know people in our system that have 400 to a thousand agents in their real estate team business. So wow. I get it. You're like, okay, you're, you're essentially running a brokerage and having multiple models kind of is going to be a little tougher. So that that's not the number one criteria. We wanted people to have a great lifestyle that's absolutely, it means they have a life, not just a business. But we tried to make everything about the models. If we have to choose between two, we went with the one that scaled the best and had the highest profit margin. I'll tell you, both of those models scale. One's a little bit more simple, one's a little bit more profitable. But when I look at any tension out there, it's between those two models. Does that make sense? I did, I did it to you again. I just started talking and monologuing on you, so I'm sorry. It does. Like, everything you said, it's... We talked to maybe like four different teams in the past three weeks that have one of them's done one way, one of them's done the other way. And it's hard to sometimes get people's exact numbers and how much profit they're making and why they're only making it. So like, that's where the, the I guess it's, it's, it's good to hear like from your perspective, because you also been having these conversations so much, like it, it's said in that way, because that's exactly the decision we're trying to make. Do we want a simpler business where we're just like, like, I have a, we were interviewing an agent who's young. He's like a, a little bit younger than I am. He seems like he's got an enormous amount of hustle. And I'm like, okay, well, if I can just find maybe like 10 guys like this and they all run both buyers and sellers. And is that simpler, even though I'm giving away a little bit more commission or do we, do I still want to negotiate and work? So I think it helped me. I think it makes me think that I should, we should give the showing agent model a chance because I could see. I like the idea of having like a smaller, high, more highly efficient team, if that makes sense. Like if you're, that, that's you the know. pros and cons you're going into. Like if you use the showing assistant model, you can build a team that tends to stay together longer, right? Yes. Yeah. And you're providing a much higher income opportunity for your buyer's agents because now right. they see a path. They don't have to leave you to kind of have a business opportunity. Yeah. Because they can hire, if they can build their lead pool and have referral clients and all of that stuff, right? Because, you know, a lot of people bond with the business during their buyer phase, mm. and then they come back as sellers later. So if they're building that within your business, I mean, I, I've seen buyer's agents with showing assistants that make 250 to 350 to 450 is probably the most I've seen in terms of wow. in one year. And wow. that's a huge income opportunity, Right. And now you're also out of the most, the least desirable part of the job. Now, do you also have to negotiate a lot of offers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part of the job, but you have a huge income opportunity so it can create longevity. The downside to that is you have less turnover, but when you do, it's harder to replace that production. Got yeah. it? Yeah. On the other side, it's much easier to onboard because basically you're just counting, everybody's going to know at least three or four people they're going to sell to this year. And there's going to be people that are bad culture fits. Like you're, you're running what I call a brokerage model where you're a lot less selective on the front end. And you know that there's a lot more turnover that's going to happen, but you're never going to be held hostage at anyone. And you've got a simple kind of economic model. The thing over there is you're always in recruiting mode. 
Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a, a brokerage office. They have to have a full-time recruiter to constantly be building the bench and bringing people in. And yeah. then you have to have someone who trains them. So we look at a lot of these big teams. They essentially are, are running a training organization or a coaching okay. organization and a training, right? Because they understand to have all those agents moving through, there's going to be turnover. I've got to recruit them, onboard them, get them into production. And when they leave, replace them. So. Yeah. Pros and cons, like is one perfect? I think you have to ask what sounds like something that I would really want to latch onto for a long period of time. It, the showing agent model, I think just it does now because I, I, haven't, I haven't talked to anyone ever that's actually like doing it at a high enough level where the showing agent is making a decent six figure income. And like that sound, that immediately calls, I think both of us like, yes, the, yes replacing a talented person may be harder, but I'd rather have just a few other agents and us all be like super efficient and having to hold the have the training and the, the more uh, revolving door kind of model. We, so we, we had a buyer's agent stay with us for seven years. And when she chose, she actually went to become a CEO of one of our largest franchise offices. Right. So wow. definitely a great leader, a great, I mean, amazing production, but in that year, like, her former showing assistant who had become a buyer's agent had her own showing assistant kind of trailed also so mm -hmm. in one year we had 70 million in production leave our team wow tough at the same time we know and we can feel good as business owners that we created an amazing opportunity they both were amazing people so like it's it's equal opportunity unequal reward like they jumped yeah. in they took full advantage they made us look great as business owners and they did very, very well. And they've got, both gone on to be great owners. I like that legacy and it creates a legend, right? Like we had people on our team that were doing more business than a lot of the biggest teams in our market center. And we wow. could talk to them and make them like, I, I like a legendary recruiting. Like I'd like for you to be the next so-and-so. Let me tell you about her journey, mm -hmm. right? And then you can recruit to that over time. So hopefully those painful moments where people graduate from your business are few and far between. Yeah. But as you grow bigger, you can have multiple people. It was very unusual. We lost both at the same in the same summer. Right. Just really unlucky. Usually you would have that other person that would have inherited all of that other oh. person's business. Boom, you're 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 set to go. We just got unlucky. But if that happens oh. once every 14 years, I'll take it. Right. And I'm sure you've recovered and probably I'm sure you're back on your feet and probably closer, if not further than where you're at. I mean, the, we're super positive people. I mean, I feel like we lost some amazing talent. And but I do believe we've backfilled with people that bring just as much and are absolutely committed to the team. So I'm like, you know what? You always get the chance to rebuild better than you were before. Um, yeah. That's just that's evolution. We all get to evolve as business people. Awesome. Well, that very that helps a lot. So thank you for the insight. Um, sure. How, so, what do you, do you see anything going on? Like, I know this past eighteen months has been like nuts, right? With the whole shutdown last year, a lot of people will have to change how they're generating leads. Uh, there, for a point in time, you weren't even able to sell houses in most places, and I feel like this has been going on for longer. But the continual like pushing in and shrinking of the real estate agent's value and commission is like now more than ever it's right in front of us like we were just talking the other day about how the average commission has dropped like you don't see a lot of six percent commissions these days it's all two and a half percent instead of three percent per side at least in in our area i'm not sure if it's the same in austin but um have you seen any like major changes or trends just from talking to so many teams about just the industry as a whole and people trying to get in so um I'll try to break that up into like three different things because I heard there were like four questions out and I'll tackle the commission income thing. Mm. What we've seen, we've been tracking this since about 2005. In the last big hot zone, the run up, uh, you have like one of the phenomenons that show, shows up is FISBO companies and flat fee companies, not for agents, but for home buyers and sellers, right? They, right. they, they come in and they, they try to make their value proposition is we'll do it for you cheaper. Mm -hmm. We may do less, but we, we won't charge you as much. And in a hot market, it certainly can feel like all I need is a sign in the yard. And the person yeah. who can legally accept the money, like I know state by state, it's very different, like who can actually sell a home mm -hmm. and what you need to do. That's fine. 
th these discount services show up. And we were like, oh my gosh, is this the end of commission income? And we just started tracking it. And the, the relationship, and it makes total sense. As prices go up rapidly, the percent that agents charge on average tends to go down. Okay. But because the price is going up, the average commission amount is still going up. Hmm. So even when we saw, and, and there is no such thing as an average commission, right? We have typical commissions in your area because there's social norms, right? And we're, there's massive lawsuits being fought over this and, and realtors are coming down on the right side that there is no price fixing and that we charge what the market will bear based on our local market. But we saw on average them drop by a full percentage, you know, from over 3% down to just over 2%. And then they can cycle back the other way after the great recession. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, man, I have a short sale. I really need help, right? Or whatever that is. I need a lot of help. This professional now feels very valuable. Right. And so the commission charged tended to go up and what happened then is it's just the way the math worked. The commission amount still went up for the most part, unless you were dealing with like bank owned properties that were really low prices. What happened in a lot of areas is prices did drop in a couple of areas, but nationally they only dropped a little bit. And so and like I know in Austin, we were flat, right? right? The market was cold, prices were very flat, but you could still make good money, right? Even if it was a little less per actual sale. So that to me is how pricing works if you look at like a 15 year period. So right now you might be seeing a trend. Oh yeah. Don't overreact to it. Realize it may be a part of the trend that we've seen home prices in some areas go up by as much as like 30 and 40% in one year because of what's actually driving this market. Now this, will, this is what's driving it. We don't have enough inventory. Yep. Last year, um, we were just getting home builders after the great recession. It put lots and lots of small and local home builders out of business. They couldn't get loans because the banks tightened up their lending practices. And so a lot of the business got consolidated into the big players and they were only playing in certain parts of the market. And depending on which stat you look at, at the very least since the great recession, we're short at least 2.2 million homes. 2.2 million homes. Wow. They just haven't been built. They are not keeping up with demand and, you know, population change. And we've had institutional buyers, right? The big banks and private equity, and they've bought up about 200,000. So that's not, it's, it's a lot of homes, but not compared to the 2.2 million. So mm -hmm. about 10% of that is investors taking those opportunities off the market. And then you just have a lot of homes that never were on the market. And then mm -hmm. what happened last year that prevented a lot of people from wanting to sell their home? Yeah, I mean, you're ordered to stay at home. So where am I going to go? Yeah, I'm, I'm scared. What if I can't find a home, right? Yeah. What if there's no home for me to buy and my house sells? I'm afraid to have people in my home. So we've had two major artificial influences on whether someone would list or not or buy or not. And one was a lack of inventory. And then seller reluctance, even in the face of skyrocketing prices because of safety. And a lot of people were just like, if I can't pay cash, I'm going to sell my house and have nowhere to leave, live. Right. So I think we're just in a very extraordinary moment where those are hitting at the same time. Either of them by themselves would have been tough. And that makes our job as realtors to really find like we're working hard. Our buyers agents have never worked harder than they're working right now. They're yeah. putting out multiple offers. They're losing out a lot of them. They're trying to keep their buyer's spirits up. And they are hustling, trying to find that transaction, that house that they can put their clients in. Does that sound about accurate to you? Absolutely. I mean, day after day, uh, like the, the, the same objections that you mentioned, like, oh, my God, what if I sell? I'm not going to be able to buy another right. place because the prices are going up so fast. I'm going to stay. Like, am I going to end up just renting and then not find? So... We're seeing that now. The magic question is how long? I, I know this is impossible to answer. Nobody has a crystal ball, but like we've, I've heard for this past couple of years, like, oh, I think this is it. This is the last year. I think we're going to start the downtrend soon. Like, do you have any thoughts on? I know supposedly it starts from maybe like west to east in the U.S., but are you seeing anything about or not really? Maybe. Um, I, I think it's it, nobody has a crystal ball. If anybody right. tells you they can call that shot. 
All yeah. I can tell you is a broken watch is still right two times a day. They're probably mm-hmm. going to get lucky. So I would just say you watch local, watch your local market. What is affordability doing? Is there supply and is there demand? And sometimes even when there's supply, if prices have gone up and they're now unaffordable, people just at some point, they just say no more. We've actually started to see it here in Austin, which has been the third hottest or second hottest market in the country. Mm-hmm is that like my wife's like, wow, we had two listings that lasted a whole weekend. Like lasting more than like three or four days feels like a big deal. It used to be that you would set expectations. This is 45 to 90 days. Now it's yeah. like hours. It's 45 to 90 hours until we'll sell your house. It's, it's, crazy. Uh, it's crazy. But people have just kind of like, there's no way I'm paying that much for that now, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's been crazy money going around. And at some point, most buyers will just say, uh-uh. And the mm-hmm. same phenomenon happens on the other side. When the market's been cold long enough, they get up on the fence and they just said, I'm waiting. And if prices cool off or demand opens up or you know, supply opens up, now they, now they get greedy. Now I want a real bargain, right? Mm-hmm. And, it, and they'll stay on that fence until they start to see people snatching up the inventory. And our job is one, like right now is to give our, our clients great advice. Maybe you, do, maybe you should rent your home. You know, maybe you shouldn't be selling right now. I don't know the truth, but we have to ask that question because if we want to be the realtor for life, selling them an overpriced home this summer may not be the best recipe. Right. I, but I don't know. I have to look at the fundamentals. Like people go, are homes in Austin overpriced? Well, compared to three years ago, I would say yes. But again, no crystal ball with the number of major companies moving high paying jobs here. Maybe mm-hmm. they're not. Maybe we'll look up and we'll have three more years of this. And then we'll start to feel like we're the, the greater Bay Area, which we know has been kind of out of reach. So right. watch affordability, watch jobs. And those two things and lending, right? You know, interest rates play a part of it, but they're yeah. very perceptional. But I mean, first off, if people have jobs and homes are affordable based on what they're getting paid, you're going to have demand. That's typically been the long-term recipe. And I try to keep things really simple because I can't handle all that other stuff. Right. Well, thank you. I mean, that, yeah, it's, 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 Philly is not as hot as Austin, but a lot of similar things are happening. It's like, I'm asking myself the question and, and a lot of people, it's one of the first questions too, like things are so overpriced right now. What do you think is going to happen? And it's like, I don't know. A lot of people, we have a lot of buyers coming in from other areas like New York. And I'm like, the same house that's 575 that was 475 a year and a half or two years ago is it gonna it's still sort of affordable to a couple making like 60 to 70 thousand dollars a year each like is it going to continue to rise in the next couple of years so it's it is tough to answer that sometimes um, yeah i mean if you're moving to new jersey you're like wow these prices are crazy if you're moving from new jersey you're like man mm-hmm. i'm paying cash right exactly and so it's very relative as people move around from different parts of the com- of the country. Yeah. So anybody who's listening to this as a realtor can look up and see migration reports. We have them built into command. You can oh, cool. see the zip codes that are moving to your market and the zip codes that are they're moving to, which is great mm-hmm. for your referral business. But if you do a lot of business, you kind of know. Like yeah. in Austin, obviously we have a lot of inward migration from California, yeah. New York, New Jersey. Um, We actually have some from Atlanta, but our still our top ones are the classics. People are moving to Austin from Houston and Dallas, right? Like because people tend to move around the state, and Mm -hmm. those are like really easy moves. You know, I don't want to leave Texas, but there's a job for me just down the road. And but pay attention because if they're moving from more depressed areas to your area, their sense of prices are going to be very different than if someone is moving from San Jose to your Mm -hmm. backyard. They're going to be like everything's a bargain. When I moved from New York City to Austin, I remember the first time I ordered a pint of beer in a bar. I couldn't believe how cheap it was. Right. Because I was conditioned to think that 16 ounces of, you know, crappy beer cost $8. And when they said <laughs> two bucks, I'm like, I'm buying. You know, I was like, what, what is this thing? It's so affordable. And they, they had no idea why I was celebrating. So it's, it's that way on a bigger scale for your house. Yeah, um, not to, to, to sidetrack, but I did see uh, also, I didn't know you used to live in Paris too. 
Yeah, I used to live there. When I graduated from college, I took my first job as a translator for a medical company outside of Paris. Mm -hmm. And I had a good friend that moved over for his junior year. And we had gone traveling and backpacking together and had a love of, of living abroad. I mean, of, of being abroad. And he just, he left for his junior year. He came back for a few weeks to get his degree, moved back and has never come back. Wow. So um, it was a bonus to think about moving overseas, knowing I would have a good friend since seventh grade right there in that town. Right. And he since bought a house in Italy that he spent 30 years refurbishing. And uh, that's, that's where my wife and I spent our honeymoon. So yeah, I spent two and a half years in Paris and Italy uh, working as a translator. Great. And for a little Southern boy, it certainly opened my eyes to a lot of things in the world that I just hadn't seen, having grown up my whole life in Memphis, Tennessee, which is not a small town, mm -hmm. but it feels like a small town if you spend your whole life there. Right. And then if you can move directly to Paris after, or well, not directly, but I mean, if you move there afterwards, it's, yep. everything seems small. Yeah. Um, so my last question on this topic before we move to the, to the one thing uh, is any, if, say if you're a real estate agent, it's kind of a broad question, maybe if you have one or two points. Um, given today's day and age where we've been separated and now the, the economy is coming back, um, do you have any thoughts about how an agent, what an agent should be doing right now to get prepared for the potential shift, knowing that like, you know, you, how you're marketing and, and branding yourself and like we've been doing more videos lately, for example, because um, right. we haven't been historical great marketers. Do you have any thoughts about what an agent should be doing to prepare themselves for what's eventually going to come? There's always this, this tightrope of wanting to make hay while the sun shines, right? Let's take advantage mm -hmm. of the market we're in, but preparing yourself for the market that you know is eventually coming. Mm -hmm. So when markets shift, it, it tends to, if people aren't looking for the signs, it can happen. It can be happen with breathtaking speed. Yeah. Um, right now, it really kind of like I'm watching government policy, all those different things. But locally, like I said, it's going to come down to affordability and jobs as one of the main drivers. So pay attention to that. Mm. And the fundamentals never go out of style. The things that become really, really important um, when you move into a shifted market, and, you know, where you go from sellers to buyers is your skills have to really be high. What's mm -hmm. good is a lot of our buyer's agents have had to be doing, you know, practicing those conversations and role plays in the morning really hard because they're facing lots of objections right now because the market is so hot. So I just think you focus on basic skills, um, core skills. I don't, I mean, I know that there are some people that are, you know, trying to reach out and, dust off relationships with, you know, asset managers at banks in case REOs come back. Um, that could happen, right? I don't know that I need to spend that much time preparing for REO and short sales personally. What I want, first and foremost, are my people in the habit of building their skills, right? Do, do they know what to say? Do they, do they understand the market? Are they watching the market? And can they make their buyers and sellers more informed about it and make better choices? That actually never should never go away, though it's easier to relax those in a typical seller's market. So I'd right. focus first on skills and accountability. If you don't have a coach, I'd be looking into one. I've, I've had one for over a decade, even though I report to Gary. Mm -hmm. But I, I always look up and say, those are the fundamentals that never go out of style. If you don't have those things, don't fuss around with all the fancy stuff. Right. So it's basically... I in a lot of ways, it's like getting back to the basics, which you maybe should have been doing and have had yeah. uh, the, the luxury of maybe not doing it so much, but getting, getting back to the basics when you see yeah. it coming. In. When it comes to mediums like video, pay attention. Where are your clients? Right. right. If your clients are all on LinkedIn, you should be on LinkedIn. Right. Right. If they're all on TikTok, God bless you. Maybe you're wasting a lot of time on TikTok. <laughs> um, but hopefully they're in a place that you have the skills to reach them in. And that is important. Like people want to be communicated in, in the manner that they want to receive, right. right? Some people want to get an email from you. I know that if you send an email, you'd never get a babysitter, right? Ever. They, you have to send a text message or they just won't hear you. They want right. to pick up the phone if you call. So different audiences respond to different kinds of messaging. Figure out where your business is 
and make sure that you're hitting them on all of those channels consistently. And they know that you are the person that they should go to for any real estate need. It's kind of boring when you put it that way. Right. But those are the fundamentals. And occasionally they move into different areas and there's a lot of hype over the first person that was on Clubhouse or whatever. But I tend to really resist those changes until I know that they weren't a fad because fad surfing is a massive lifelong waste of time. It's very engaging though, right? It's nice to do new things in an industry that tends to focus on the fundamentals, which can feel boring. I get it. So I try to, to put a governor on how many of those things I will play with and just keep asking, am I doing the fundamentals well? And if not, why am I futzing with this other stuff, right? I should yeah. go back and do the basics well before I do the advanced stuff anyway. I think that, that what, I, what I heard in there is like com communicating with people the way that they want to be communicated to is something that's very easy to forget. I forget sometimes it's like, oh yeah, yeah I, I used to be religious about this, making notes about, I don't know if there's a, um, what's it called in command, a, 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 an option for it, but like the preferred method of communication it's so it's like underrated. Absolutely. It should so, be on your notes for every contact, you know, right. like how do they respond just right next to whether they have a spouse when their mm. birthday is, when their home anniversary, there's classic things, but definitely if you have a history of when you do your quarterly calls, they always pick up. I mean, mm. that's the richest form of communication you could have, but if they don't, but they respond to your text message, great. But mm. if they don't do either of those, but they'll respond to a messenger, like, at a certain point, if you actually are trying to know people, you can collect this information. And for our close friends, we know this. Mm -hmm. But to do business at scale, your brain is not sufficient. That's why we have a database. That's why right. we preach your business is your database. You just need to have a trusted resource for collecting all of this. I hope that it's command, but it's okay if it's just Outlook or a, a spreadsheet, whatever it is today, have something where you can, as you have these realizations about your clients, yeah. you can collect them and use them in the future. Well the best said. database is the one you actually use. Yeah. And it's the, like you said, it's not necessarily like sexy, but it's, <laughs> it's extremely effective, like ma properly managing your database. Um, you got so it. I wanted to ask a, um, I've been revisiting the one thing recently. Um, cause we've been, I've been personally been going through challenges about basically like, uh, my partner, and I are, we're in this weird zone where we've both been selling for a while, right. Have been making decent income, a little bit of burnout coming on. And mind you, we've also been investing in building up the real estate portfolio, which is what we talked about last. So I, I feel like I'm at a pretty point, like a high, a little bit of point of high burnout right now in trying to really determine what's most important to do. Because on the on one hand, we want to we'd like to eventually be leveraged, so we want to start the real estate team, and we need to hire agents and train them and all that, right? And on the other hand, we want to continue building our portfolio, and cash flow is kind of like the important thing right now, so we could do other things. And you had mentioned one of the things uh, I was listening to in an interview. It's like you had read a book that this guy talked about something like the thirty X rule, where yeah. when you when you think about and tell me if I'm summing this up right, when you think about like delegating something and passing a task off, what first comes to mind is like, oh my God, this is going to take so much time. And it might take me 30 hours, whereas I can just do this in an hour right now when I need to do this week. And I feel like I've been trapped in that a little bit. I'm like, I'm not sure what to do first. I do have my net worth tracked. I know pretty specifically how much money I'd like to make and, and all those numbers, except I'm like, I'm not sure which avenue do I continue to folk hit lead generation hard for clients and build a team or investment properties. Cause I'm, I'm moving from small one to four units to a little bit larger of an asset class. So it's like stepping out of the comfort zone in several different areas. I know this is a mouthful. <laughs> That's a little bit about what's going on. And I feel like a lot of, I've talked to a couple of people recently who go through, it's, it's hard to step out and make, several changes at once maybe yeah. um so I, if you have any uh, so i'm just trying to figure out like how to really hone in on i don't know what i should do first and i and i i'm in this little mental loop and i'm just in a funk right now so it's easy to get there and sometimes it happens not just in tough times but when you have a lot of opportunity staring at you right right that's it that's literally what it is like i've got like we've never really had to raise money or anything to do anything but 
when you start looking at like we're looking at a, a 10,000 square foot warehouse, for example, and it's we probably can get it for somewhere around four hundred thousand dollars. It would need a million or something dollars worth of work. That's now beyond our capacity to tackle on our own. And although I had people that would be interested in investing, it's a whole nother process and more hours and just, you know, to, 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 to do that and to go with syndicating money for a project, a, pro a type of project, which I've never done before. So I've been like kind of holding back still like, ah, let me, let me just tackle the next house again, you know, but that's not what I really want to be doing. I'm really looking to do the larger projects and, a lot, and more than a few people I know are kind of in the same spot where it's like you keep finding the easy ones, the houses, which you already know how to do. And that's great. Um, we're looking for bigger, bigger projects at the same time as the whole I have to sell houses to pay my bills right now. Well, I'm going to try to address this in a way that's not specific to you, because mm -hmm. one, if it was and I was actually trying to give you advice, I would ask you a whole lot more questions and sure. maybe even make you bring out like a spreadsheet okay. so we could really analyze it. So in general, uh, it sounds like you've got more than one one thing right now. And yeah. that happens to all of us, right? And you're not clear which one's the true priority. So there's a few right. options there. You hit pause and you invest the time to figure out if I have to lean into one or the other, which is the better opportunity. And mm -hmm. when I'm coaching someone actively, I'm working with Jeff, you know, but I'll say, yeah. but if you had to choose, if you had to choose, you're not choosing now because you don't have to, but if you had to choose, which way would you go? Okay. If one of these were to go away 100%, if you neglected it for a minute, which one would you hope went away so you could keep the other one? However you trick your brain into it, figure out which one's in the first mover seat and which one's clearly behind it. Second observation, okay. when you have more than one, one thing, it usually means you're missing a relationship. Your world's growing, right? But your leverage to deal with it isn't. And that's where a lot of burnout happens. You can be a great husband and a great father and a great business person. Those are things that I believe you should be able to do all the time forever. But if you're doing actually four different jobs, if someone really looked under the hood and trying to squeeze them into 60 or 70 hours a week while being a good husband and a good father, something is suffering, most likely you. And over time, you can do that for a sprint, but you can't do that for a long time. And a lot of entre entrepreneurs are adrenaline junkies. They love the excitement of juggling tasks. They <laughs> love the excitement of new opportunities. And I'll tell you, because I've lived long enough and I've also seen it down the road, um, people literally will have like adrenal fatigue and the, the physical consequences of constantly being in that flight or fright mode which is very stimulating, actually have horrible consequences for your health way down the low, down the line. So mm. it's not, I'm not trying to pull a scared straight episode on you here, but you should look up and go, what I have to do now is either make a hard choice or if I want to do both. And I, I, and I love and a lot versus or. I love mm. it because I want my world to grow. Then I need to bring on somebody who can help me manage that world. So maybe you need a, a, a true executive assistant, someone who really takes all of the 80% off of your plate, even if like they need their own assistant to get it done and a virtual assistant for their assistant, right? Mm -hmm. There's a reason what's, you know, the, the career path of an, a personal assistant goes all the way up, not to an executive assistant, but to a chief of staff. That's the highest position on that org chart when you look at that career path. And so they eventually get into leverage too. I mean, Gary's, assistant that he hired right about the same time that I joined him has a team of at least nine or 10 people, accountants, CPAs, oh. right? Uh, other assistants, personal assistants, all of that stuff, ranch hands that report up to her. And then she reports all that back to Gary. That's how you get a lot done mm. is you have very competent, capable leverage and people, you get your, the biggest ROI of any investment you can make. So this is not where you try to save five grand. You should okay. hold it accountable to giving you right. that much of your time back and your ability to make that much more money. So go all the way back to our earlier discussion. The first hire, when you're doing all you can, you get help. And that help is at admin help. 
but maybe you need to be grooming someone to run your investment or your real estate business. You can still be the interesting character in the business, right? right? You don't have to have the job of it. And will they do it as good as you? No, they won't. That's the 30X rule. And uh, it's from a book called Procrastinate on Purpose. And it was buried at the back. And uh, basically, the reason most people won't get into learning how to delegate is for something they do well, it might take them as long as 30 hours to train someone to do a task that takes them one hour as well as they do. Here's the reality. It doesn't always take 30 hours. But if I trade off and every week say I can do it faster over the course of a year, how many hours have I wasted on that hour long task when I could have invested 30? Right. Yeah, 52. Right. Yeah. So you subtract 30 from that 22 wasted hours just in the first year. Right, because right. I didn't make the upfront investment. You're an investor. You know all about making investments, right? Yes. So you make the investment of time so that you never have to do that. Or instead of taking an hour, it takes you 10 minutes, right? To check, mm -hmm. to make sure it was done well. But you make that investment to get that time back. And my friend, Ben Kenny made a great observation. That's leverage or it's luxury, depending on what you do with the time you get back. If you're hiring someone to clean your house or mow your yard and you're using that time to drum up business, right? You're working the phones or whatever you do for lead gen, that's leverage. If you're using it to lay on the couch, drink a beer and watch your favorite TV show, that's a luxury. And mm. so leverage gets abused in a business. But if you're literally going to give them your 80%, free up your mind and your energy to put more business into other stuff, sometimes having a small army you know, one, two, maybe more really capable admin staff can free you up to have those front facing right. jobs and do the parts of them that you'll still have really well. But I'll still go back. Who on your sales team could you groom to eventually run it? Would That's you give up profit? Yes. But I would rather like I'm, I, you own the pie. You're giving up some of the slices to the person who's going to maintain it and hopefully grow it for you. Would it grow as fast as if you were running it? No, but you wouldn't also have three or four businesses going if you had to run them all. Right. So make those choices, figure out what the priority is. If you're the owner, you can say, well, this is the most profitable and this is the thing I'm most passionate about. Well, I can tell you, whatever's new is almost always gonna be what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. So give it some time. Don't neglect the golden goose, right? For something new until you've absolutely earned the right to jump over there, right? So don't jump too fast to the new thing or you'll lose the golden goose. Yeah. But over time, you can say, look, I've got to stay in my real estate business because that's the prime driver. I'm making this up. But then I'm going to hire and find my replacement in that business. And my net income will drop because theirs is going to go up. But that will also free me up, right? When they've been doing that for a while and they have their replacement on the bench, now you're looking at a two, maybe three year time period, which most people never do. But again, upfront investment that buys you years and years on the backside. So those are the tensions. I can't give you a perfect answer, but yeah. you can accomplish more than one thing, but it usually requires other people. Well, thank you. You covered a lot there. So thank you. And I think even just the, like the example you just said, like, I think that's kind of, I've been leaning towards it. I just have to do it. But like, it's the, I like doing the sales more. I'm sorry, the investing more. And I think I need to just take the leap of, it's it's just a leap of faith, I guess, um, in many ways, like of saying, okay, like maybe I'll still be the face, but I'm not thinking about not selling houses anymore. But I've been doing this since I was just 20, basically. It's a very weird thought. Um, and I think maybe well, cherry pick, like, like I said, you, you will, you won't, it won't be a cold Turkey moment. Right. I talked to Ben Kenny, like he still gets some like repeat clients. It's like, if this million dollar home, I'll still go sell a home. Right. Right. I want to keep my skills sharp because you could get the job back. Right. But now you're not going to cherry pick. So as to ruin that person's opportunity, but like, right. I'll give you an example. You know, I seventh leveled, right? I started the one thing business by hiring my first employee and tried to do it all through leverage. Mm. I was always kind of half CEO, half chairman of the board. 
And in the beginning, I had to show up a lot, but within literally months, Jeff started taking those jobs and he started running that business. Oh. I still reserve the right, like a grandfather or an uncle, like I want to hold the baby when I want to hold the baby. Yeah. So I've got a, a famous author that's going to be on our webinar that I pointed them at. She said, yes, like, I'm sorry, I'm stepping behind the mic, Jeff. You get a day off whether you wanted it or not, because at yeah. the end of the day, I get to be the, you know, the godparent or whatever. I, I'm going to hold the baby. But at the moment, there's a smelly diaper. What am I going to do? You're going to, <laughs> there you go. Back at like, you. Because ultimately, he wants to feel like he's building that business, right? He, he has pride of ownership, just even if it didn't start with his money. And right. he has ownership. He right. earned it over time. But there is also that role, right? If you are the executive chairman of the board, you are the founder, you can always step back and have strategic jobs to keep you in touch with the business. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that, I think that example is going to help a lot of people and how you explained it. Um, I hope so. With, and and, and like it's not said, like it, you could just sell your real estate sales business for any realistic multiple, right? No, no, no. Yeah. And like you said, like it, it may not always take as much time, it might not take 30 hours, it might take less, hopefully not more. Um, so that's a good I'll segue. Tell you this, it's a muscle, Rodney. Mm -hmm. The longer, the, the, the more time you spend trying to leverage stuff onto other people's plates, it's a skill just like anything else. Mm -hmm. So I will tell you what used to take me 30 hours to train someone on, I now have hacks and tricks that had shortened that most of the time. And that's because right. I've just, I've almost become addicted to business income, right? Because business income truly call it passive, as passive as you can make any income is very, very rare. Mm. And you start to appreciate that in business and in investing. And you want to foster the skills that make it happen and, and learning how to right? Give someone a set of tasks or responsibilities, train them to do it, and then hold them accountable and incent them to do it long term. Those are just skills. Right. Nobody like came out of the womb with that knowledge. It has to be acquired and you can grow it over time. So don't be discouraged if your first efforts are, oh, I hired a horrible person. Well, of course you did. How many people have you hired? Right. right? And then you just work your way through it. That's a perfect segue because I was going to ask my, uh, uh, my next question is going to be like, what does your day to day look like these days? I know you have a couple different businesses and I think I had heard in, a, in another interview that you had like a construction business uh, that you were working on before that kind of goes side and side with your sales business. Mm -hmm. um, so are you spending most of your time like publishing stuff or in KW or? I mean, I've got a job. I'm the VP of learning. Okay. And I have now four departments that report up to me mm. and my job is to you know i see my job is to develop those leaders that are running those departments and occasionally i mean i also have all the ticky tacky stuff right i have to review all the contracts i have to sign all the bills ultimately gotcha. because that's what responsible it's like a little business that i'm running through other leaders yeah but my job is to be there for them to groom them towards where they want to go and to tell them often the hard things that they need to hear, even if they don't want to hear, because that's what I've learned you have to do as a leader. There's a uh, Keith Cunningham who we've interviewed a few times. He said something that I wrote on, the, on my wall. You can't see it. I've got a little bulletin board over there. Right. It's um, nothing happens until what's unspoken is spoken. And think about how often we bite our tongue. We're thinking something but we don't give our employees the benefit of that thought. So they're trying to achieve a standard that we haven't even articulated for them. We're just judging silently back there. So I learned the hard way that if you want people to rise up, you have to point them in the right direction. You have to tell them what you expect so they can say, no way, Jose, or sure, I'll do that. And then they may stumble, they may need help, but it, nothing starts to change until you actually are willing to articulate those thoughts and put them out there. And fundamentally, I think leadership's all about courage. So anyway, I have my job. That is by far the biggest time consumer of all. Um, I meet a couple times a week sometimes. Like I have two meetings this week with Jeff and his team for the one thing. I think that's the other big opportunity. I own a publishing business with Gary that we've aligned almost perfectly with our jobs through licensing agreements. And so if I want to write a book, I can do it on this time. And Keller Williams gets some benefits and I get benefits. We just lined up those dominoes. My wife runs our real estate team, right? 
If I didn't have her, I probably would not have a real estate team that I could say I co-owned. And inside that real estate team, um, I referred to her, a gentleman that I met and who happens to be the partner of someone in one of my other businesses who had a unique background in construction and helped us start Papazan Homes, which is home maintenance and construction. Mm. And so that's a little business within a business. And what you'll see a lot of what we do is, is this a natural offshoot? So yeah. is there someone in our world that this would be a perfect opportunity for them? And hopefully that matches up. That doesn't always work out. We've had plenty of failures, but that's kind of the way we look at it. We have our real estate investments, which we manage ourselves. Right. And we abuse our real estate team for that, right? We just made yeah. that part of the job description. And um, when Wendy has a personal assistant, one of that person's job is to make sure that all the rents were paid on time. And mm -hmm. so we try to leverage out the least important, not the important, but the least uh, fun stuff, right? If we can. Because what I've discovered, there's usually someone out there who not only the stuff that you hate, they love, but they can do it 10 times better than you anyway. So mm. if you can find those people and their leverage, not luxury, you can start building multiple businesses and streams of income. And there's other things like we've made investments that were purely passive in other people's businesses. Mm. And really, I just have to show up periodically and let them know that I'm, I'm watching my money. You know, I want to read the quarterly report. So I want to interact with the founders, but you can grow your world by just being a little bit present at strategic times as a, as an investor, as an owner. And then, you know, no matter what, hopefully somewhere in there, one of your jobs is a job, whether it's CEO or something else. Right. 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 And right, uh, again, I just, bleh, hopefully yeah, that made sense. It did. And I heard a similar theme, like I had um, interviewed a big real estate developer um, here in Philly a couple of weeks ago. And he, he kind of said it in a similar way that you just did. Like when you have, um, let's call them like supplemental businesses that kind of go alongside your main business, it's as long as you have a point person, um, I think you mentioned the gentleman you hired who was a partner of someone you knew, as long as you have a point person that runs it and manages it, I'm assuming like it doesn't take since your main job is to, is you have a main job, you're not spending a lot of time necessarily running those businesses. And if you're leveraged, right. Um, it's, and it, this is like, it sounds like such a logical concept to say out loud, but I've never really internalized this because we've been, ta we've talked about doing, we're in construction already having construction business, maybe having like a, a there's two or three other supplement incomes that we're, we've been, yeah. we just haven't pulled the trigger on. It's like, Oh man, we should just do this because we are missing so someone. People. You're missing that, someone. Yeah. And when you get the right person, they do just kind of take very little of your time. And it's really fun. You're right. I enjoy coaching people who want to be coached, who want to grow. Right. And uh, I had a chiropractor. We were talking about an employee that really frustrated me. And he said something that I'll, I've stolen ever since, but I usually credit him. Yeah. But he said, I'd always rather say, whoa, than giddy up. Oh, like and slow down. If, if you have to provide the energy and motivation for people to go and grow, you're, you're not really getting the leverage you need, right? Because you can only divide that up so many times. Yeah. I like being on the side of the equation where I'm like, Rodney, you're doing too much. You need to spend more time with your family. You need to have time for yourself. So let's talk about you slowing down a little bit. I just ethically, morally, I want to be on that side of the conversation, and, you know, versus why are you leaving? The job's not done. Like mm. I, that's a manager, you know, you feel like you're having to be a principal. The other one, you get to be their coach and saying, you've done enough. This is an amazing week. Go celebrate. Right. And mm. we'll, we're running a long race. It's not a sprint. Let's stay in the game. Go home, rest, see your family. We'll come back Monday and do it again. Right. That's such a more pleasurable conversation. And over time, you get better and better. But nobody, not Gary Keller, nobody has a perfect record of picking those people. So you have to learn other skills, right? You know, some, one of those skills is accountability. And eventually, you know, you have to learn how to let people go if they're just a bad fit and take, take responsibility because who hired them? Right. Exactly. So what do you feel like your greatest challenge is today, um, either personally or professionally, just everything you have going on in business and in life? Well, it's a time of extraordinary change, right? And that usually means there's a lot of opportunity. and I just think a lot of us are exhausted. 
a lot of our people are exhausted. I think there's a lot of people that are going to be, there are, I mean, statistically 30 to 40% of people are preparing to quit their jobs right now. Mm. They've come out of this and um, they've decided they're going to live their purpose somewhere else. Their job is no longer compatible or they just have to have a fresh start. And right. so I just think that intellectually, I understand that this is a time of enormous opportunity. Usually when things are in flux, um, there's a lot of opportunity out there for people who are looking for it. Um, at the same time, I, our challenge for Wendy, I, and our leaders on our team is trying to manage our energy so that we can stay after it. What I don't want is to look up and be burnt out or have my people be burnt out. So, um, you know, we're trying to make sure, like I literally, I can show you, we pulled the PTO, that's our paid time off for every employee that reports to me. And I'm sure just making sure, like, are they taking time off? Mm -hmm. And I told our whole executive team that I was doing it. And I just said, you know, I look up and I've actually taken a week of vacation in half a year. I get six weeks a year. I've been here 21 years. Wow. So I'm setting a horrible example. And if you aren't taking time, do you really think the people that look up to you are going to take time? You're, you're creating an example. So I think that's going to be our challenge is how do we keep the talent that we really want to keep? If people leave us, are we going to be ready to backfill them with people who are even more engaged in the, in the journey we're going to be on? And I also just want my legacy to be that people, they, they got to that next place they needed to be with us. Mm -hmm. And burnout is not where anybody wants to go. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to just make sure we're not reaching for too many things too often, too fast. So that's hard to do, right? When you're kind of wired to grow things, you have to tap the brakes and just realize not no one can sustain at the pace that we've all been moving. No one. And not with all yeah. the trauma and fear that we've had to deal with. So acknowledging that, honoring that, um, and still saying, and, and we can still move forward, but we're going to do it at a pace that, that is sustainable. So that was a little bit messy, but hopefully you got the gist of it. I can relate to that. And I think it's someone, especially when you're uh, in business for yourself, like you'd mentioned a couple of minutes ago, taking time, like an example, if someone's doing great in a week, taking time to celebrate and stop and like, oh, go, no, stop. Don't work tomorrow. I, yeah. I, for one, I never do that. It's no. very hard to to uh I, but i'm sure you have a system for it like that's that's a great uh oh i'm uh, bad at that my wife is my system i married someone mm. who loves to celebrate right and she holds me accountable to celebrating she laughs at her own jokes all the time i was watching her working <laughs> out listening to her own podcast and just cackling it's like i can't do that i would have been hearing all the errors like because i'm yeah. wired like when i win a race my first thought is oh thank god i didn't lose it's horrible but I've got yeah. this mindset of, of moving away from something that's negative versus that other thing. And it's, it's served me really well. Mm -hmm. And so luckily for me, I chose someone. I asked her to marry me. So I get to say chose. She said yes. Mm -hmm. So she chose me back. But she makes me better at that. And she, she will absolutely say, nope. Now, the other thing I've done is I'm very good at turning it off when I go home. Mm -hmm. I just learned that if I don't, I get... I, I can't, if I don't have any creative space, a lot of my best thoughts happen when I'm not actively looking at the problem. So I come uh, home, um, I'm not on my email after six o'clock. Like once we're at the dinner table, it's very rare for me to go back to work. I'll get up early and I'll work if I have to, but I try to create clear partitions. I'm off or I'm on. And I, I will say I'm very disciplined about that, even if I'm not so good at celebrating the victories, because I'm always on to what's next. Thank right, God right. I didn't lose and what's next. And I live in the past and in the future, but not as much in the present. But my wife keeps me there as much as she can. That's good. And I think that's it, you got to do that. You have to set those kind of boundaries to have it be sustainable. You know? Yeah. So my yeah. one last question before we wrap up is um, in another um talk you given i think you'd mentioned that your your original goal was to write 13 books um, that was gary's vision oh oh it was gary's vision okay yeah gotcha do you have so i guess i'll reframe the question do you have a publishing wise do you have a goal is there anything 
fun or that you could talk about that you're working on right now or uh, books coming out or goals you know in the first in the first 12 years of our partnership we completed and published i think 11 different works and some of them were privately published and some of them were out there with our names on it sometimes we had other people that were authoring and we did a lot of work behind the scenes but there's like six of them that were bestsellers with mine and gary's name on them Cool. So I think we were very productive in traditional terms. And those books have sold now over 5 million copies. And since then, we haven't published anything, but that doesn't mean we haven't been writing. So um, we're on draft four of MREA2. I feel like there's about half of it that I would feel very comfortable going to press. Gary's got another one thing right now, right? We're combining five companies into one to form KWX. He's had to have a couple of transitions in leadership as we've moved and change the direction of the company. Right. And you talk about the golden goose. Would he rather be in the writing room? Yes. He's been doing this other job for 37 years. Right. But it's also mission-based and he knows that his ultimate responsibility is to make sure that that business is absolutely taken care of before he hands it off to the next custodian. Mm. And so we're waiting on him for MREA too. Cool. We've updated um, our first time home buyer book. Um, we really, it was outdated. So that's done. It's really like missing 30 pages now. We found out that one of our stories was about Levittown. And, you know, if without the, the Black Lives Matter and the unrest last year, I would have never, we would never done the background research to find out that was a case study in redlining and discrimination. So we, mm. we cut it out of the book and oh. we get to make it better and more appropriate today. So, um, and then we actually wrote two drafts of a one thing novel. And so oh, we've got multiple in... book projects that are in various stages. And I suspect in the next 12 months, we'll start to once again, start the pipeline of having them come out the other side. But okay. it usually takes a few years of background work to have something show up in the world that's worth doing. And I spent, I'll, no apologies, the first four years after the one thing, I was like, this is a once in a lifetime. It hopefully we'll have more of those, but for certainly at that moment, I've been in publishing for 30 years. That was an extraordinary opportunity. I refused to do anything but support that book to make sure it had every opportunity to change lives. Wow. So I have no apologize, apologizing for that four years where I wasn't very focused on publishing. I was still keeping my habit as a writer of reading and researching and writing. But man, I wanted to support that book. So anyway, lots that lots that are that is in the works. Some of it I hope that we'll be able to share as early as early next year. Cool. Awesome. Well, look, you did a good job. <laughs> You've been <laughs> doing a good job so far. Thanks. Um, and I, there's like you said, millions of other people appreciate um, the works you're putting out. Because this is like it really is it's cliche to say life changing, but like someone at the right time could pick this book up and have have a, a mindset switch that like that completely changes everything they really i'm sure plenty plenty of people have so yeah um, and that's that's the real juice by the way yeah, um that's your legacy selling books is not the best business model right it's very archaic there's a lot of there's a lot of forks on that plate from the time it leaves our hands until the royalty checks come in mm. and so as a business model it's not super sexy Right. But when I get an email because a father has started walking his daughter to school every day and that has made all the difference, the simple things, it's not like my business has doubled. It's stuff like that that I know will really matter. It's the stuff that I hope is the kind of stuff that people remember at the end of life and they're grateful that they did instead of wishing they had. And that's, mm -hmm. a, that's like we talk about that at the last chapter of the book, right? We really wanted people to have fewer regrets and more glad I did versus I wish I had. Awesome. So um, last question uh, or last wrap up here, where can people find you online these days or how, how do they get in touch? Um, well, I'd usually tell people to go to the one thing.com um, or, you know, jpapazan.com. I mean, I'm, I'm the only Jay Papazan, I think in the world, um, oh. certainly in the United States. So I'm eminently Googleable. Unlike, you know, Jack Brown or something. Mm. So if they Google you, they're not finding anybody else, basically. Nope. Unless it's somebody in, in, in pretending to be me. Right. To my knowledge, <laughs> there's gonna watch no one else with my name on the world. 
Someone's gonna watch this and name their child Jay Papazan, but or well, you know what? <laughs> they they wouldn't be able to do that unless their last name is Papazan. And there's not many of those. <laughs> So awesome. Well, I want to thank you again for taking the time um, to Thanks for having this me. interview today. And I'm looking forward to the next books that you have coming out, maybe seeing you on a stage at a physical mega camp one of these days or a family reunion. Oh, yeah. Um, I hope you I've can heard... make it to Austin this summer. We're going to we're going to open the gates for a few people. We'll be able to have a limited audience and hopefully by next um next winter when we do our family reunion, we'll get to go to the full blown event. It'll be safe for everybody to show up. Cool. I'm going. I'm going to, unless it conflicts. I actually probably going to be in Paris for like uh, a week or two. So good for you. I haven't heard the dates uh, for Mega Camp, but we're planning on attending. Go to week. Paris if you have to choose. Go to Paris. You can always watch the video later. That's a good point. That's a good point. So, all right. Well, I very much enjoyed this. Thank you again, and hopefully we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks, man. All right. I'll see you.